Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Brain Blaze. Ah, as always, I'm your host, Simon Wimes here. One of my writers, this case, Kevin Rice, me a script. Publicity stunts that turned out to be deadly. <laughs> Nothing funnier than some death. Let's get into it. Companies will just do... Uh, if you're new here, the format is I've never read this before. We're going to read it together. It's a... Uh, we explore it as a team. Let's go, team. Go, team. Companies will do just about anything for publicity, regardless of the consequences. We've covered some of these before on this channel, such as the Crasher Crush, an 1896 publicity stunt devised by William Crush, in which he founded a town in Texas for a single day just to crash two trains together at high speed. It's insane. Like, they, they just got full-on trains that weren't being used anymore, built some track, and just whipped those trains together. And it was, it's just insanity. I'd love to see that. I wish there was like a 4K video of it, but there's not because it was in the past. Can someone do that today? Just get some old like, I don't know, some old train. And trains go fast now. Let's get some of those trains that go like 300 kilometers an hour and just BOOM! That'd be awesome. That'd be a viral video. Very. Maybe Mr. Beast should do it because it seems very expensive. He should do that. Come on, Mr. Beast. Let's crash two trains together. You're up for it. Use that beastie money. It was an epic spectacle to behold, except for the two people that died being hit by shrapnel from the trains. Okay, yeah, just let, let's make sure no one dies. Maybe put, I don't know, like a big perspex box around the trains, like, or, or, you know, in front of the spectators, or just do it in the middle of nowhere and just have cameras, like for nuclear tests. Make sure everyone's really far away, because there'll be a lot of shrapnel. Crush was immediately fired on account of the death and the negative publicity, though he was rehired the next day because the advertising stunt had proven extremely lucrative even after their eventual settlements with the victims. What were they advertising? That's a good question. Imagine if they're advertising. I don't remember. I don't think Kevin said. It's just what they're advertising safety of trains. And it's like the only times trains are dangerous. Oh, and we plow them into each other at high speed. Sorry to jump in and interrupt today's video, but I've got something exciting to share with you today, and that is today's fantastic sponsor, Vessi. Now, Vessi make waterproof shoes, and they are absolutely fantastic. They're 100% waterproof thanks to a special material called Dymatex. And you might be thinking, oh, well, my feet are going to get all sweaty then. They never do. In fact, I wear Vessi's all winter, all summer, all. I just wear Vessi's year round basically and your feet don't get sweaty they don't get wet it's just uh it's just a perfect shoe and it also looks super cool this is a new one to me it's got this kind of leather material here looks brilliant similar to uh, another pair that was fabric all over but these are with the cool leather then there's these beautiful white pair of shoes also this more sneakery looking pair here i also regularly wear the boots in the summer i think they're called boardwalks we're just going into fall now so i've been wearing the boardwalks all summer enjoying the hell out of those in fact this one is actually called the vessi soho they're a bit of a masterpiece really they got this gusseted tongue dimatex technology of course and a sleek synthetic leather exterior grippy non-marking outsoles and a cushy midsole plus this new overcast jacket check it out it's brilliant so here's the deal go to vessi.com slash blaze for 15 percent of your order a big thank you to vessi for sponsoring the video and now back to today's episode it just shows the corporations are willing to do literally anything no matter what danger it poses to people so long as it makes them money to be fair kevin this was like over a hundred years ago when corporations were like oh what's in this medicine cocaine morphine alcohol and red flannel R red flannel there's shirt in here pieces of shirt and this is the kids version like <laughs> companies did not now there's like more rules and sh which is nice because it means like less people dying in horrible publicity stunts and from cocaine that shouldn't really be a surprise as it's not like they do these things with calamitous intent when crush decided to slam two trains together it was because he correctly thought it would be really cool and it was crush i know two people died but you can't deny it's fucking cool to slam two trains into each other you don't get to see that every day the deaths were an unfortunate byproduct of that bike but cut but katie railroad wasn't actively trying to kill people they just didn't really give a shit one way or the other wait was it really the railroad who was doing this <laughs> Railroad, like, it's like, hey, you're advertising your car. Showing a wreck of the car is not a good way to advertise it. Unexplained fires are a matter for the courts. Can you narrow? Despite not being malicious machinations randomly selected from a magical murder bag, all of the things that we're going to be talking about today are obviously terrible ideas and the people responsible for them really should have known better. The one chip challenge. Is this the super spicy? Did someone die from this? Isn't that the super spicy chip? I've added an extra ingredient just for you. 
The merciless peppers of Quetzalcoatl Tenango. This story just broke about a week ago at the time of writing, so probably about three months ago by the time we finally get these videos out. Brave Lace has such a long production time. I don't. I, it's just it takes a while to get these out. I'm sorry. And let's be clear, all of this is entirely allegedly, and I'll be throwing in loads of allegedly just to be safe, Kevin. Okay. That said, it's hardly the first time that this stunt has faced negative publicity. Paqui is a brand of American tortilla chips made by Amplify Snack Brands. Though surprisingly, that is a subsidiary of the Hershey Company. Wait, the chocolate people? If you told me a dangerous internet challenge was going to be the product of a chocolate company, boom, I would have assumed it was Nestle. Damn! Oh, Kevin! Throwing that, yeah, Nestle fucking sucks, in my opinion. And Kevin's opinion, apparently. Like, Nestle and their, their history. Like, I try not to buy Nestle products. It's, sometimes, it's, it's basically impossible, though, because they make so much good sh**. But it's like, also, that company history, it's like, it's like... I don't know if it's bad. It's, it's like IBM and some of these like histories of companies. You're like, holy shit, should I really buy those products? Like, IBM's easy to avoid. Nestle, not so much. Mmm, Nestle. <laughs> This is literally a Nestle product. Anyway, the one chip challenge, as the name might suggest, is one single tortilla tip. That chip is generously seasoned with Carolina Reaper and Naga Viper peppers, the first and sixth hottest peppers in the world, respectively. It's sold in a box shaped like a coffin, with the chip further sealed in a protective wrapper. I don't believe that they included them this year, but in the past, the box also had contained latex gloves to wear when handling the chip, as you wouldn't want to get chip dust on your fingers and then put your hands anywhere near your eyes. Oh my god, I was just. This is really bad. Like, I was just chopping a, a non-spicy chili pepper. It was like one of those really mild, big chili peppers. I can't remember what they're called, but like without too much spice in it. I was just chopping it up and then obviously I itched my face at some point because then the side of my face was sore for the whole evening. And I forgot that. It's not even a spicy one. This mega chip, that'll like blind you. Allegedly, in my opinion, probably not. The entire point of this product, other than to make you pray for your own death, is to consume the chip, then post your reaction on social media. More specifically, you are instructed to eat the entire chip, then wait as long as you can without eating or eating or drinking anything else. The instructions seem to imply that lasting at least an hour without eating or drinking is the goal, though I would recommend against it. There's no way I'd ever do this. Like, I don't, th you couldn't, I don't know what amount of money, obviously there's a point where it'd be like, Simon will pay you a billion dollars, they'd be like, <laughs> let's go. But it would have to be really large because I find this, I get sweaty just, I'm starting to sweat on my head just thinking about spicy food. I love spicy food, but it is, I don't like food that is like nuclear levels of spicy, it's just pointless. The One Chip Challenge has been around since 2016, and starting in 2017, they added dyes to the chip to turn your mouth blue as proof that you actually ate the chip. I guess the first year, the challenge hashtags must have been filled with people swapping it out with similar looking chips or just pretending to eat it, so Pakwe wanted to keep everybody honest. On the one hand, I sort of get this challenge. People eat something super spicy, post their reactions, and a good time is had by all. Except it's not, Kevin, a good time is not had by all. Did we not just discuss how spicy- I'm sweating thinking about how spicy it is! I'm sweating like J. Edgar Hoover trying to squeeze into a new girdle. That's the theory, at least. However, I don't understand how Pakwi has been able to repeat this stunt every year for eight years, given the reaction videos. Maybe I'm just too old to understand social media trends, but scrolling through TikToks of people taking the one chip challenge is basically nothing but people crying in pain and throwing up. Oh my god, this makes you chunder. That's fucking spicy. That's not some sort of hyperbole either. With the exception of one video from some dude whose entire social media presence is dedicated to eating insanely spicy foods, literally every video I saw was just tears and blue vomit. Oh, I don't want to know. Well, that'd be people in the emergency room suffering from unbearable stomach pains. If your product's sending people to the emergency rooms, like, that's nuts. This should, I mean, of course it can be allowed. I, I can't see, you, there's no reason why it's not allowed. It's just spicy food. And I guess even if it wasn't allowed, they'd just be, you know, they'd do that like stupid disclaimer, like not for human consumption or like decorative purposes only. And it's like, yeah, bro, we know what that's about. If people are eating that sh Adults have been taking themselves to the hospital after eating the chip for years, but the problem only got worse each year as more and more kids got their hands on these potentially dangerous chips. According to the packaging, the one chip challenge is intended for adults 18 and over, but according to the packaging, Tide Pods are laundry detergent, not food, so I don't think the label was going to deter people anyway. The Tide Pods are soap, and that's not food, so please stop eating the Tide Pods. Oh my god, the Tide Pod Challenge. Was I don't really, really even remember what that was anymore. Was that just people eating those little laundry pods? That's gonna that's not good, guys. Don't do that. Are we stupid? I mean people asked you, but then there was the cinnamon, cinnamon challenge. Wasn't that giving like people lung damage because it was like and then all the powders were like ruining their lungs? 
Besides, it's not like alcohol or nicotine products where you actually need to, to produce a photo ID to purchase them. However, children seem to be more susceptible to the effects of capsaicin, the compound that makes pepper spicy. This makes sense, since capsaicin is a chemical compound and children have smaller bodies, so the same amount of chemical would have a larger effect on them than an adult. ER visits from the One Chip Challenge became a big enough problem that medical professionals began warning against people taking part in Paqui's social media publicity stunts. Yeah, I mean, in America, right, you gotta have, like, health insurance or they just bill you, right? I feel like in the UK, or like Europe, where it's like, you know, the government pays for your shit, then they'll be like, we gotta ban these because it's wasting a lot of money fixing people having their stomachs pumped and whatever from being poisoned by this chip from this company. They'll be like, we gotta ban it, it's too expensive. In America, they're just like, yes, get in the hospital! It makes the economy go round! The National Center for Poison Control even has a webpage dedicated specifically to warning about this challenge for over a year. But it all came to a head on the 1st of September of this year when 14-year-old Harris Wallabar ate one of these chips at school. Harris, who attended high school in Worcester, pronounced Worcester, not Worcester or Worcester. All right, I got it right first time. <laughs> Worcester. Oh, pronounced like I don't care. It's B-U-C-K-E-T Bouquet Massachusetts Oh, I see. Worcester in Massachusetts was in such severe stomach pain that the school called his mother to come and pick him up. They returned home, but two hours later, Harris was dead. I know this is deadly publicity stunts, but did it really kill him? I mean, allegedly? Whether or not the chip is to blame is still being determined, though the timing is certainly suspicious in my opinion, and it seems unlikely that an otherwise healthy teenage basketball player would suddenly stop breathing. I agree, somewhat, but I'm also, people die. It's unfortunate, but even young people die statistically, it happens, it's less usual. But it's also like, I don't know if it's, like, it's a spicy chip, right? Like, is it, is it? Oh, oh, I don't... Did it kill him? I'm not so sure. We'll find out, I guess. <laughs> it's known the large amounts of capsaicin has the potential to cause heart attacks, though such cases are pretty rare. Still, Pakui has already gotten their desired publicity after doing this challenge for seven years. Once the ER visit started to pile up, they probably should have settled for using their name recognition to sell whole bags of pretty spicy tortillas instead of individually wrapped chips that may or may not send the consumer to the hospital. Hold your wee for a wee. Oh no, I know this one. This is... I, I, well, I won't spoil it, but this this one's brutal. Sorry about that, Simon. I know the last entry took a little bit of a dark turn. No, I was expecting it, though. Nobody expects the vanishing position. Like, I, sometimes we're just doing a script and then <laughs> Gavin will just be like, and then they died! And I'll be like, what? But this one is deadly publicity stunts. I know people are gonna die. Not that the first one was necessarily a deadly publicity stunt. It seems just coincidental that a kid died, in my opinion the opinion of the courts until proven otherwise. Maybe this next entry in our episode about publicity stunts that turned a little deadly will have a happier ending. Wait, I know it doesn't. Well, someone's badder bladder bursts, Kevin. Ah, oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Blow the picture for me. Here, I'll even start you off with a fun little anecdote. The year was 2007 and I just moved into an apartment with my girlfriend at the time, both fresh out of college. As recent graduates in a collapsing economy, it was impossible to find decent paying jobs, but we managed to keep our bills paid and scrape together enough money to afford the one thing our apartment was missing, a Nintendo Wii. <laughs> Ah, that essential item. I never had a Nintendo Wii. I've just always been on PlayStation and Xbox. I was just... I, Nintendo... I, I've had a Game Boy and stuff when I was a kid, but I've always just been more on the, the, the Sony and Microsoft side of things. Anyway, carrying on, not interesting. The only problem was that we had to find one first. Oh yeah, these things sold out. This was so popular. Even though it had been a few months since the system's initial launch, they were still seemingly impossible to find. I must have called about 50 different stores to see if they had any in stock. And when I finally called a nearish bike target, I asked the man on the phone if they had any Wii's, and he told me, yes, come by like six. I confirmed that he meant they were getting a delivery at 6 o'clock that night, at which point he clarified, No, come by like six of them, or we have too many. While the entire country was in a wild scavenger hunt trying to track these down, I stumbled upon the one store that was apparently sitting on pallets and pallets of wheeze. But on the other side of the country, 20 people had lined up to get their new toys the old-fashioned way. Radio contest giveaways. Hosted by KDND in Sacramento. <laughs> That's how they say it, isn't it? KDND in Sacramento. The morning show, Morning Rave, was doing a contest as a publicity stunt. The last thing I want to listen to in the morning is rave. 
Like, I want to get up. What should I put on the radio? I don't know. Rave music? No! I just want something relaxing. It's the morning. I'll sip my coffee, listen to like some slowish music. I don't want to be like. It's like, what? Oh, oh, stop. Stop. It's too early. A friend of mine, when we were at university, he was obsessed with this band called, I don't know if they're a big deal, but the only reason I've ever heard of them is because of him, called Faithless. And they have like, it's this weird electronic music that I'm not really into. And there's this one song like, called God is a DJ or something. It's like, God is a DJ. And like, we, you know, we'd be hanging out, like this mate went to a different university. And so we'd, we'd go up, me and my mate, we went to the same university, we'd go up and we'd visit him. And we'd go out on the lash, have a few too many beers, wake up the next morning, be like, oh, oh. Ah, oh, deep regrets. Deep regrets. I'd to be like, should we make some breakfast? And I'd be like, yeah, sounds like a good idea. First, let me turn on some music. <laughs> Why? Why are we listening to this? <laughs> Put on something relaxing, it hurts. They had one wee to give away to the person who could drink the most water without going to the bathroom, hence the name Hold Your Wee for a Wee. You can roll your eyes all you want, but that's a pretty f***ing clever name by morning radio show standards. The title of the promotion, that was not the promotion itself. The promotion was a horrific idea, and they absolutely knew it. Starting just before 7am, each contestant was given an 8-ounce bottle of water to chug. Hey Siri, how much is 8 ounces in milliliters? Two hundred and thirty-six milliliters. Okay, got in English. Eight ounces. Why do you measure liquids in weight, America? It's weird. A uh, bottle of water to chug. Every fifteen minutes, they'd be given another bottle, and the quantities of water consumed would increase. One by one, the contestants began to drop out, and every time the DJ checked in with the contestants, they complained about being in pain. Oh, the pain. The pain. Well, that's what happens when you need to pee and you don't pee. It's like, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah, oh, I gotta go. But the DJs were not concerned. They also weren't concerned when people began calling into the show saying how dangerous this was. When a nurse called in saying that this was not only dangerous but potentially life threatening, the radio host claimed to be already aware and stated that the contestants had signed a waiver saying that they couldn't sue. Oh, of course, that makes it perfectly acceptable. Doesn't it? That doesn't work, does it? Like, all the time, right? Because they're like, well, you, you can't just sign away liability completely. This wasn't actually the case, and the waivers they had signed only addressed using their names and likenesses for publicity and didn't mention any potential health concerns. Well, in that case, you're just dumb. Not only were the hosts, and uh, not the contestants, the people who set it up, because they're not legally protecting themselves enough. <laughs> Why would you do a dangerous contest and not have proper waivers? You're a big radio show. KBLA or whatever it was. California. You don't have a legal department? You don't have someone who ask about this? Like, you're on the radio, come on now. They got faces for radio. Not only were the hosts not concerned with the call's warning of the peril facing the contestants, they also made it clear that they were well aware of the death of Matthew Carrington. Matt, who was also from California, had died just two years earlier doing this exact same f***ing thing. His was part of a fraternity hazing ritual rather than a radio contest, but the end result was the same. And just a few months before this publicity stunt took place, Governor Schwarzenegger signed Matt's law into effect, making it explicit clear that you can absolutely sue people for shit like this. Good for you, Schwarzenegger. I just watched his uh, documentary on Netflix, Arnold or whatever. It's great, and his autobiography is great. I like Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's a legend. I'm coming day and night. The hosts knew all of this, but they didn't care. This is the problem, like, I didn't know you could, like, hold your Wii until you died. Yeah, but uh, the first time I heard about this was because of this, but now I know. And these people obviously knew, apparently, so what the fuck? Instead, they began to tease one of the contestants, 28-year-old Jennifer Strange. She was a petite woman trying to win the Wii for her kids, and the radio host said that she looked like she was three months pregnant because the water had distended her stomach. Very classy, guys. In the end, Jennifer threw in the towel. She accepted the second prize place of Justin Timberlake concert tickets so that she could finally go to pee. Unfortunately, though, it was too late. As she drove home, she called her work and complained about having a massive headache, which was the last thing she'd ever say. She was found dead in her home later that day from water intoxication. Not only had she been unable to win the Nintendo Wii, but now her kids wouldn't have anybody to drive them to that Justin Timberlake. Oh, fucking hell, Kevin. It's probably for the best. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That just left the matter of the wrongful death lawsuit that was obviously going to be filed against the radio station and its parent company. Like, <laughs> normally I'm not someone for like, yeah, you know, sue, sue, sue. But in this case, fucking sue the sh out of them. Get that bag! The trial lasted for a month, and somehow it took the jury a full week to deliberate. Jury, just be like... <laughs> 
fucking guilty. 100 mil. While that is pretty shocking, it's probably because of the way wrongful death lawsuits work, at least in America. You see, when somebody dies, who is really to blame? Maybe somebody else's product, actions, or negligence were directly responsible for a person's death. But isn't it kind of their own fault, too? Every party involved in a wrongful death suit needs to be assigned a percent of the blame by the jury, and that includes the victim. Fair! That's fair! I don't have a problem with that, as long as most of the blame is assigned to the radio station and they end up cutting a fat check. Yeah, of course, she's a little bit to blame because she she went to the studio and she took part in the game, but maybe she didn't know it was dangerous and the people who were organizing the game did. If that's the case, way more of the blame is on them. If she knew it was dangerous, it could potentially kill her. I don't think she'd have taken part in it, would she? So I don't think she knew. Fortunately, though, hopefully unsurprisingly, it was decided that there was no contributory negligence, which is to say that Jennifer was 0% at fault. It does surprise me. I'd have given it like a few percentage points at least. So she'd have gotten slightly less money, but hopefully still loads. I assume the discussion centered around whether or not the radio station's parent company should assume any of the blame as well, but it was decided that the station was 100% at fault. Jennifer's family received a judgment of $16.5 million in damages. Fucking yes! For a tragic and very much preventable death. I like that a lot. That's a lot of money. Let's go. I mean, obviously, you'd rather her not be dead, but still, 16.5 million? It's gonna ease the blow. Late Late Breakfast Show. I'm guessing that you're familiar with this one, Simon, but my fellow Americans are extremely unlikely to have ever heard of this. You had my curiosity. But now you have my attention. It's not a publicity stunt in the traditional sense, but since this segment on the show was the focal point of their publicity and pr promotions, I figured it was worth including. Let's find out. You know, Kevin, don't you shouldn't make assumptions about me and my Britishness, because as everyone British watching this show knows, there's like huge gaps in my knowledge of British culture that I just don't don't care about. But let's see. Let's see. Maybe I have heard of this one. Despite the name, which makes you think this would be something people watched while sipping mimosas shortly before lunch, the Late Late Breakfast Show was a Saturday night primetime variety show. Makes perfect sense. Late Late Breakfast. Was this supposed to be a clever name? It's not very clever, is it? I've seen it compared to the early years of David Letterman, but I was a Leno man, so I'll have to take everybody's word for it. I've no, I've heard of David Letterman and Jay Leno. Jay Leno. But I don't like. I, I couldn't tell you what David Letterman looks like. Jay Leno, I know, because he makes those car videos on YouTube. But David Letterman couldn't tell you what he looks like. We have our own like evening hosts. Like, what's his face? Thank you. Very helpful. Um. Well, actually, we export some of them, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Americans. You got you got exported those two guys. Who no one likes. Um. Oh, fuck. What's his name? The 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 the. The guy who hosts that late night show, like, with the other guys. He does the singing in the cars. I can't remember his name. But, and also Piers Morgan. Really sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that. Anyway, it was an extremely popular show for five years in the early to mid-1980s, and one of the biggest segments on the show was something called Give It A Whirl! Viewers from home, just random everyday people, could call in and get a chance to spin the whirly wheel. It was basically like the wheel from The Price is Right, except instead of monetary values, the wheel was filled with dangerous movie-like stunts. Oh my god, I do know this one. I think I've talked about- I, I think I've made a video about this or something. Is some, someone like- We yeah. Spoilers. There's some crazy stunts and it just goes horribly wrong. The viewers couldn't actually spin the wheel themselves since they were at home, but it would be spun on their behalf. Whatever stunt it landed on, they would get one week to prepare before performing it live on TV the following episode. This is not going to end well for me. This is not going to end well for you, no. This was an epically horrible idea. I don't know, I think the idea is quite nice. Just obviously the execution's gonna go horribly wrong. These were incredibly dangerous stunts using untrained and frankly unprepared civilians as cannon fodder for ratings. Quite literally, as one stunt involved a woman being fired out of a cannon. She only broke one bone though, so that was a good stroke of luck. Oh my God, if your stunts are regularly, this should be like, just like people bungee jumping or jumping out of planes, you know, doing regular shit, not being blown out of a cannon. That's not safe. That's for that's for people in the circus, not regular ass people. It's always like, do you want to go skydiving? I'm like, sure, I'll go skydiving. Yeah, no worries. Done that before. It's fun. But like being blown out of a cannon, I'd be like, that's not something people do on the weekends. Speak for yourself. Like, there's a reason that that's performed by professionals, right? Let's not do that. Plus, she got to be on live TV. Woohoo! There were all sorts of crazy stunts, like jumping a car through a flaming hoop or riding a motorcycle on the wall of death. <laughs> Oh, 
that's that crazy thing that spins like this, isn't it? It was basically like the Globe of Death, a pretty common motorcycle stunt used at carnivals, except much taller and with no roof. It was also in the studio, so if the motorcycles went too high up the wall, they would fly out of their enclosure and into the audience, which did almost happen. Oh my lord, the past. Like, did they... <laughs> well, health and safety not like, you can't be doing that, what are you doing? <laughs> These stunts were genuinely dangerous, and there were lots of complaints from the public as well as threats from government agencies. These threats and complaints were almost entirely ignored, because you just couldn't argue with the ratings the show was getting. The only time they actually pulled a stunt was when the health and safety executive, the government agency that kept making seemingly empty threats, forced them to abandon a stunt in which a person would be pulled out of a chimney by a helicopter before the chimney exploded. Oh my god, Late Late Breakfast Show. One, your budget is insane. And two, you are insane. Insane, I tell you! To the best of my knowledge, there was only one stunt ever performed on this segment by an actual stuntman. The goal of that stunt was to send a car off a ramp and see if it could jump over 230 feet worth of cars. It definitely can, as the current record is well over 300 feet, but this particular car couldn't. Or at least it didn't on the night that the stunt aired. Stunt driver Richard Smith crashed the car in a big way, live on television, and he failed to walk away from the crash. But did you die? <laughs> Now, he didn't die, but he had some broken bones, and the car was so destroyed he probably couldn't open the doors without help. But because he wasn't seen walking out of the car wreck, the show's host, Noel Edmonds. Oh, Noel Edmonds! I, I know him. He's like one of the guys. That's why he's like one of our, like, TV guys like Jay Leno. He's the old thing called, like, Noel's house party or some sh He had to continue the show with no idea whether or not this guy was still alive. <laughs> Can't you just be like, uh, we need to cut to the, the technical screen of like the girl using the blackboard and drawing the crosses. That's not international, is it? That's like a British thing. Show it on the screen now. Don't tell me what to do. It's like, beep. I just be like, no, let's check whether this person's alive because otherwise he's going to be thinking about it. The only good news about this whole story is that the show never aired the death of anybody on live television, but that's because the death happened during the rehearsals. Like I said, the viewers had a week to prepare, and they did this with help of the BBC of BBC One and the show's crew. In November of 1986, Michael Lush thought he was the lucky volunteer that was going to take part in the show's next big stunt. It was called Hang 'em High, and the stunt was supposed to feature Mike bungee jumping from a box suspended 120 feet in the air by a crane. This seems fine. Like, bungee jumping is one of those ones like being blown out of a chimney but while attached to a helicopter seems like that's not something people do on the weekends. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Daddy. But bungee jumping is. The box was also going to explode. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Disregard. Is, uh, that's not something people do on the weekends. God, you're boring. Mike showed up for the first rehearsal, but you wouldn't have known from what was going on that anybody was prepared to rehearse. There was no safety officer present, no stuntman to train Mike, no net or airbag, just a giant crane and some random dude with no experience or instruction. Oh yeah, and they didn't seem concerned with the fact that Mike had just had a couple of lunch beers. One suspended in the box. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Once suspended in the box, there was no way for Mike to contact the crew back on the ground. There was also nobody up there with him in case he changed his mind. According to the crew, he waited for two minutes before jumping, possibly because he decided he didn't want to. When he did finally jump, the flimsy carabiner clip his bungee cord was attached to sprung free from the crane, and Mike died on impact with the ground. Oh my lord. Noel Edmonds resigned from the show as soon as he found out what had happened and the show was cancelled entirely as a result. I would expect nothing less. The list of safety violations and improper procedures that took place is frankly too long to list. It was grossly irresponsible and the final outcome was honestly infuriating. Over on the Casual Criminals, we're always saying, what are you doing in America when it comes to criminals somehow escaping jail time? But I finally get to say, what are you doing in England? The official verdict in Mike's death was death by misadventure and the BBC made a voluntary payment of £120,000 to Mike's family. But there were, uh, weren't there like pretty gross violations of like these health and safety things? Wasn't there? I don't know. Like, I'm not going to say there are because obviously none, they didn't get super punished. So let's see. However, the HSC did finally make good on their threats, and the BBC was prosecuted for violations of the Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974. Good. They received the maximum fine under the law. You won't believe how much it is. That's the maximum fine? Are you shitting me? It's two thousand pounds. Damn. I knew you wouldn't have asked unless it was really high or really low. That's probably like, isn't that like three thousand dollars, two thousand five hundred, something like that. What the fuck you do in England? <laughs> two thousand pounds? A man died. Jesus Christ! That's where we end today's video. Thanks for watching.
If you told me a dangerous internet challenge was going to be the product of a chocolate company, boom, I would have assumed it was Nestle. Damn. 